Well, the Cumberland River in the middle of the wintertime, I'll tell you what, it doesn't get any more stunningly beautiful than this, does it? It is certainly beautiful down here. It's a great place to be. Today we're doing something that I've never experienced before. We're actually in search of what is gonna be the state's largest fish. You know, for a number of years now, we've been stocking lake sturgeon into this system. Uh, and we've got fish that are, are up above 20 plus pounds and approaching 50 to 60 inches if we're able to get some of our older fish today. Lake sturgeon, we've been reintroducing them back here in Kentucky now since, what, 2007? 2007 is our first year class. The first stocking went in in 2008, so we're committed to a 20-year restocking effort, so we're getting close to the end of that stocking frame right now, and so far we've seen pretty good survival. 20 years is a long study, but that's what it takes to learn a little bit about lake sturgeon, and we're gonna learn a little more about lake sturgeon today. You're gonna pull some data, hopefully we catch some, and we're gonna learn a little more about why we're reintroducing them here in Kentucky. All right, let's get to this first line here and see what we got on there. It's not like most fishing. We wait till we have a fish to put water in the live well. With 400 hooks, we feel pretty confident we're gonna have one, huh? Yeah, these lines are set kind of with the current. Helps us avoid some tangles. Also, lake sturgeon tend to feed as they go up the river, so. They'll eat benthic macroinvertebrates, things like that when they're younger. They'll continue to eat that throughout their life cycle, even, even large, you know, 30 plus pound fish. However, once they get big enough to gape size in their mouth, how wide their mouth is, uh, will become large enough that they can start um, preying on smaller fish species as well. So today you're using all night crawlers though, right? Today we're using all night crawlers. It helps keep things standardized in terms of the data. I have to ask you, why this location? Why here this time of year to try to catch them? We are kind of looking at their migration patterns. It's part of the study, so there are some telemetry studies going on right now. Yeah, an earlier portion of the study uh, was telemetry. We've wrapped that up. Uh, and we've moved on to a monitoring stage to see how these fish are, are surviving, growing, just kind of how our stocking efforts are, whether they're being successful or not. All right, well good. Let's well, see what we have. Hey, with night crawlers, who knows what you may have? You never know. About every fish I know will eat a night crawler, right? Absolutely. <laughs> And a mud puppy, I already seen that joker. Yeah, occasionally we do catch them. Sometimes we have lines with several on them. Uh, for the most part, they're eating night crawlers as well. So we'll catch them and we'll take the hooks out of them and release them and most of the time they swim off just fine. We've caught them every year that we've been doing this. You might catch 20 plus on a line. Now, people need to realize that there's a difference between a mud puppy and another big species of salamander we have here in Kentucky that we're actually trying to reintroduce and that's the hellbender. These are not hellbenders, these are mud puppies, right? Right, typically they're gonna inhabit different types of areas. Uh, hellbenders are gonna be more in your highland streams often. These mud puppies are not getting anywhere near to the size that hellbenders are at maturity either. Yeah. Look at there, channel cat. Channel cat, Matt. And typical for a channel cat that's been on the line, he's got that thing twisted and curled as many times as he can. So you can see they're pulling these hooks. Now they're gonna rebait and put these back out to pull more samples tomorrow, but you can see how they're managing these. If you've ever pulled trot lines, you've probably seen this is a box that just has some cuts in it, and they'll pull each one of these individual hooks and they'll spin that box around, and that helps them manage and keep the line from being tangled. Now when they go to put it out, they'll go in reverse, they'll pull them up and bait them, back up and pull the line right on out and put it back on the bottom. Channel cat, Matt, just go. popped off. Quick release. Actually getting a, uh, a quick release is uh, speeds up the process today, so that's a good thing. Yes, it does. We got two red spotted newts here that we also got that actually weren't even on the hook. They had just wrapped around the dropper. Oh, we got a leg sturgeon. I'm gonna need to reach back and get that uh, net. There we go. Wrapped up in there. There you go. Well, there's our first lake surgeon. Now this is uh, it's a little bit younger fish. What do you think? Your best guess? What do you think this is? A two-year-old fish? That's probably a three-year-old fish three -year -old right there. Fish. Okay. So, and you guys are going to check this thing to figure out how old you think it is. Get some measurements. What other data will you be getting today? Right. So we're going to take total length 
uh, fork length, which is essentially to the fork of the tail. They've got what they call a hetero circle tail. So that top half of the tail can be a little bit longer. So sometimes fork length is a little more indicative of growth. We'll also be weighing these fish and putting a tag in them so that if we recapture them, we can kind of follow them as far as when we caught them, how large they were at that point in time. Got that line pulled in. We're gonna head on down to our next one and see what we've got on that one. We got sturgeon about to oh, surface. Her, her. Sturgeon about to surface. Awesome. There we go. Oh, that's a good one. All right, so we're just checking for a pit tag here. And this one does not appear to be tagged. Looks like a right 7-8 on the scoot removal. Fork length 21-0, total length 24-1. Total weight 214. All right, so we're gonna be putting this pit tag into this fish now and that'll allow us to track it if we recapture it. And just to make sure that it's in. And we've got it in that fish successfully. So this is a nice example of a lake sturgeon. You know, you've got the three rows of bony plates, the dermal plates that cover the skin. And these plates are large and really sharp with sharp keels when the fish is young. They tend to get smaller as the fish grows and the keels become more blunt. Um, the interesting part of the sturgeon around the head and the snout or rostrum is they've got a lot of uh, sensory cells, especially on the underside of the head. These are called barbels, which are just fleshy tentacles that hang from the snout and they are covered with taste buds and they use these, they drag them along the bottom in search of food and they'll actually suck in the sediment like silt and mud and screen out the insect larvae. They extrude the mud and sediment out the gills. So that's how they feed. Their vision is not super poor, but they don't have highly developed vision. They feed by taste and they rely heavily on their sense of smell. It has a cartilage skeleton. They are the most primitive or ancestral of the bony fishes. And so essentially they're living fossils and haven't really changed much since prehistoric times. The cool thing is about these fish is that they are very long lived fish. The bad thing is for on a restoration side that this fish, if it's a male or a female, may not be able to produce offspring for how long? If it's a female, they don't reach sexual maturity until they're 20 to 25 years old. So the males are a little bit sooner, 15 to 20 years. This fish has several more years. If it's a female, more than that before it's sexually mature. When they do reach maturity, they only spawn on average every four years. So you've got a low reproductive potential slow maturity, all these things are what make them so vulnerable to overharvest. If you catch one, we ask that you return the fish back to the water, but we would also like to have information on your capture date, a photograph of the fish, the location, and any other information like the bait that was used, the depth where you caught the fish. All of this helps us with our monitoring efforts. We got another one coming up. Oh! A real good one. So this project will go on for the rest of the month, trying to get a bunch of individuals and collect all that data to help you guys manage this species. Yeah, we'll be continuing to set trout lines at a few different sites here and on the main stem of the Cumberland for years to come. And it's very cool to get to see a fish that most of us people out here that are outdoorsmen, we don't get to see that. So thanks for bringing us along today. Yeah, no very, problem, Chad. Very interesting work. Yeah.